and finally look to Lord Monckton to close the case for the opposition. My Lords, it falls to me on behalf of Her Majesty's Government to reply to the proposition that has been advanced this evening. Now, in the social mobility unit at the Cabinet Office, we do not call a spade a spade. That would not convey the nuances of the situation. No, we call it a one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust, yet adequately efficacious, lignometallic composition, designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilisation on the part of hourly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural or constructional trades or industries, as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may from time to time be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, expedient, desirable, apposite or germane with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task or objective in hand, or on the other hand, under foot, Prime Minister. <laughs> now, I have a confession to make, and that is that I worked for Margaret Thatcher in 10 Downing Street during that agonising time of the miners' strike, and I am proud to say, particularly in the presence of the Honourable Lady who has just graced us with an excellent speech, that I, in many respects, took the side of the miners internally. And I did so because they were very badly led. Arthur Scargill, who was their leader at the time, was a communist who had been trained in Moscow, first at the Patrice Lumumba University, and then after three weeks there, he was transferred to the Lenin Institute. And this was in 1979, between July and December. And the Lenin Institute was where the top opponents of capitalism were trained. He came back and then he led the miners, who were very loyal to their leadership, sadly, because he was not acting in their interests, but in those of a foreign power. And he led them out on strike. And that, to my bitter regret, led to the premature and unduly precipitate demise of the deep mining industry in this country and the destruction of communities such as that to which the Honourable Lady belongs. I profoundly regret that that was the outcome of those events. I cannot say how sorry I am that it should be so. I can say that several miners came to my farewell party at Downing Street when I left the service of the Prime Minister after four years there. And it was perhaps the first time that working miners had ever been invited to come into Downing Street under a Conservative government. And in many respects, therefore, I find myself on the proposition's side in this debate. Because it is true that while the Honourable Lady has told us she does not wish to change her class, she remains fiercely and commendably loyal to her background, to her family. And she is the only person on either side in this debate who has used the important word love. And she loves her family. And that is something which none of us on this side of the house would wish to take away from anyone. And of course, if you, come, if you come from a mining community in Durham or in Yorkshire or in Nottinghamshire or in Scotland or in Kent, there were so many of them until they were all suddenly closed down. Of course, you remain loyal and you don't want to change your class. But I think it is perhaps too much of a leap to go from not wanting to change your class personally to saying that nobody else can either. 
because it has been well established, I think, on this side of the House, by the Honourable Proposer and the Honourable Seconder for the Opposition, the Honourable Member from Cambridge, that there is now more opportunity than ever for people who do wish to change their circumstances to do so. Does this mean that they must thereby sever their relations with and their love for their family? No, of course it does not. But never has there been greater opportunity today, never has it been truer to say what Benjamin Disraeli used to say, that in this society anyone may succeed who defers to the principle of that society which is to aspire and to excel. If you want to do well, you have the chance to do so. Let me give you a test. As you can tell by my accent, I'm from Yorkshire. <laughs> so how many people from Lancashire are there here? Well, you see, Madam Proposer, if people from Lancashire can get into university, there <laughs> is social mobility for you. <laughs> so I think we must take a more generous view than the uh, lady who has just spoken was willing to take about the degree to which there has been an increase in the possibility of and opportunities for social mobility. But I think it is also incumbent upon us on this side of the House to say that we are every bit as dissatisfied with the, as the proposition are, with the progress that has been made. In the end, I want it to be self-evidently true that anyone may succeed in our society who defers to the principle of that society, which is to aspire and to excel. And I can tell you that the Honourable Lady has spent her academic life in council estates studying what it is that locks people into the spiral of despair, low income, dependency on the state, grotty housing built by ghastly council ar architects who know they'd never have to live in it. You would not want to live in some of the council estates that she and I have visited as part of our studies of this question. And she is a pioneer in this field. It needs to be done. But I think that the gentleman who spoke from the floor and said that if you deny that there has been any progress, if you say that the class system is entirely static, then what you're doing is you're discouraging those who might wish to help a little further and push a little harder to make sure that every barrier to achievement on the part of those who wish to achieve is knocked down and taken away. So I hope, uh, yes, madam, wherever you are. Yes. Yes, uh, this point has been made by, by the uh, proposition, certainly. It doesn't matter if we, it's not about discouraging individuals not to aspire to their aspirations. But it's not a question of just individuals. Whole societies can get together if they wish. I'm going to California in, in, uh, on Sunday because I'm going to see a movement there that is not satisfied with the United States and wishes as an entire society, half of northern Canada, uh, uh, California, I'm sorry, and half of southern Oregon, they want to leave the United States because they do not think they can fulfill their aspirations individually or collectively within the United States. I'm going to find out what that is about, and I shall write a paper about it when I get back. So you don't have to confine mobility just to the individual. Whole societies can, as so many of those gallant mining communities. The miners were and are the heroes of labour to me, particularly the deep miners in Britain. Those mines were disgusting places to work. I went down a mine when I was a lad and I didn't like it, and I got out of there as soon as I could. But at least I could. Now whole communities 
have to either lift themselves out of uh, the misery in, in which they may think they live, or, with our help, they may collectively just rise up and make themselves anew. And what we must not do, and I think this is the big danger in the proposition tonight, is we must not discourage those who wish, both individually and collectively, to change their status from moving into whatever level of society they think is appropriate for them. It is not for us whatever class we may conceive ourselves to be. I, like Tacitus, am interested in all humanity. I do not regard myself as a member of any class. And I think that progress will be made when everyone is able to say the same without, in any sense, denying their background, but without in any sense desiring to be in some different class above or below that which they are in. There are far more important, far more urgent subjects for this House to debate than class. Class comes up time and time again. It's bound to do. It's such a good topic to talk about. But there are more serious things that Her Majesty's Government has to address, such as the mounting national debt, which is about to reach 50% above the Maastricht criterion by which we are still legally bound. We are in breach of the Maastricht Treaty. And therefore, we have to make sure, for the sake of not having a complete financial collapse, that the national debt is reined in and that therefore the social provision that we are able to make can safely continue. These questions are more important than the motion tonight, which is no small reason why you should firmly, unhesitatingly and cheerfully reject it. Thank you.